I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. We're talking to James Altucher, former colleague of mine at Street.com, entrepreneur, great stock analyst, also author of a new book called Choose Yourself. James, how's it going? Frank, it's great to talk to you. Gosh, it's been like four or five years since the street.com. It's times have changed. <laughs> times have changed a lot, man. It's been, it's been crazy. We did it. We were fortunate enough where I, I took Porter, Porter Stansbury has a podcast and I actually subbed in for him and you happen to be the guest on that podcast, which is cool. And we had a great interview for like an hour, but my audience for the SNA investor podcast may not know you as well. And I want to start out by, by talking about your book, which is creating a lot of buzz. Choose yourself. Uh, Porter Stansberry calls this book an instant classic. He doesn't really talk too much about books, but he's really high on this. I mean, what was your inspiration behind the book? Talk a little bit about it. Well, Frank, I, I basically say that in this world, in this economy, everyone that you thought was going to choose you for safety, whether it was uh, your corporations or your banks or the government or your education or whatever, all of these things have abandoned you. And so now the only way to kind of get success and happiness, and even some peace and safety in our lives is to choose ourselves. And so what does that mean? I, I describe my own personal story where I've gone through this horrible roller coaster where I've made money, I've gone bankrupt, I've lost everything, lost house, family, money, everything I could have possibly lost, I've lost. Then I've made money again, then I lost it again. So I had to take a little step back and say, well, what worked for me? And what didn't work for me? And then I started applying what worked for me over and over again. I started to make it a daily practice, and I found success again. And knock on wood, it's a daily practice. I hope I keep doing this every day. But I write about specifically what I did, my story. I write about the stories of others. I write. I address kind of the concerns and fears that we have in our current economy. And I put it all together in this book. And the feedback has really actually blown me away. Like people are really responding to this book. It's been it's been a, a bestseller. It was on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. Uh, it's been the number one book on Amazon for nonfiction for a couple of days. Uh, it's really been surprising. Yeah, and a lot of people, if if you don't know James, I'll give you a description of him. You may be the most humble, brilliant person that I know. 
<laughs> oh well, thank you, Frank. I really appreciate that. Seriously, because whenever I talk to you, you're always talking about the mistakes you made. So you're identifying with the, the average person because we've all made mistakes, and you know as well as I do. From you know, you're going on CNBC doing interviews, and even when you're watching these things, a lot of people are so quick to talk about themselves and how great they were and the best calls. And it seems like the first thing that you always do is you say, "Listen, yeah, you know, I lost money here, and, and this is why this didn't work." But I'm telling you, this is going to work this time. And I think you're able to identify with with, with a lot more people and you're kind of seeing that with this book right i mean the response has been overwhelming hasn't it yeah well you know it's funny because you see this not only in let's call it financial self-help which is really what the financial news mostly is and you also see this in self-help nobody wants to admit that we're flawed people at heart like we all wake up a little bit scared a little bit empty and we spend the day trying to fill that emptiness but i always like to say a, a garden can't bloom without a good amount of rain. And the rain doesn't always feel good. You need an umbrella, you need good protective clothing and so on. But again, the garden doesn't bloom without rain. And that's what our daily lives are like. We need to experience the rain in order to to blossom. Now hopefully the, the, the pain and adversity that we experience is not so great for each person. It's different. Hopefully many people are, are more mature than me. In my book, I just describe specifically what I have done to kind of come back from the grave where I was literally suicidal. And, you know, I hope people don't get that far and people can choose their own ways, their own paths to success. I describe mine and I also have the stories and testimonials of other people who have done similar approaches to life that I have had. And it's interesting, James, because you also talk about health issues on the way up and on the way down. And this is where I think Porter identified with you because a lot of people think, hey, you're successful at business. Things are great. But sometimes it gets to a point where, you know, you, 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 you're not talking to your family as much. You have health. You're staying up all night. So, you know, you, it's affecting your health. And, and you cover a lot of this stuff, don't you? Yeah. I mean, what, people always say to me, oh, I'm stuck in life and I'm miserable. What should I do? Well, always take a step back. And you can't, you can't move forward without first taking a step back and building the foundation. You can't build the house without the foundation. And what the foundation is, is you have to focus this second today on physical health, which includes eating well, exercising well, and sleeping well is probably the most important of that. So sleeping like seven, eight, nine hours a day. Then you have to focus on emotional health. Too many people are like arguing with their bosses, with their family, with their, with their spouses, with friends, whoever. You have to be around people who are positive, who inspire you, and who you inspire and love. Mental health, which is, I don't mean about being crazy or not crazy, but how do you develop ideas? Like, everybody lets their idea muscle atrophy, but every day... I take a waiter's pad with me because it it's very small and has uh, it's perfect for making lists. And I write down a list of 10 ideas. It doesn't matter if it's 10 business ideas, 10 book ideas, 10 ideas I can uh, uh, show my kids I love them. Just make enough ideas that your brain sweats so you know you're exercising your idea muscle. And that turns you into an idea machine. But it takes about six months. You have to do it every day, and it works. And then finally, spiritual health which is always, even when things are low, always having a sense of gratitude for the sheer abundance in your life because your body just feels better when you're feeling grateful as opposed to when you're feeling angry. And it's something you can practice all day long, any moment of the day. You can practice feeling grateful. So those four aspects of health are the foundation of how you choose yourself. And from there, it's amazing what can happen. I've seen so many just magic literally happens when, when you turn yourself into the magician. Yeah, you, you know, it's amazing too what I realize, and you don't have to admit this if you don't want to, because, you know, I travel a lot and travel outside the country. Americans sometimes are not grateful. I, I mean, for example, uh, you know, I'm right after this podcast, I'm jumping in my car, I'm driving 17 hours to New York to see my family. There's some people that say, man, I, I got two kids in the car, it's got to be a nightmare. For me, you know, I'm going to see my family who I don't get a chance to see. We're going to barbecue, it's the 4th of July, nieces, nephews. I mean, is it a different way to way people look at life in America? Because, you know, sometimes we take things for granted like, like water, which people in China don't really have, but yet there's so many things to be grateful for in America. Yeah, it's, it's really a good point, Frank. Like, um, America, I don't want to sound, you, you know, America has its its problems, obviously, and, and obviously its issues in the economy and in the government and so on, but, you know, you're right. We have, you know, we have clean water, we have food, 
you know, no, very few people are starving in America as opposed to China where, you know, 80% of people in hospital beds are there because of illnesses related to dirty water. So, you know, there's so much crime and corruption in other countries and other governments, and there really is a lot of abundance in the United States. Like, even though the economy feels shaky, there's so much technological innovation, like all technology in the world comes from America, and the innovation and the artistry is here. Like, you can't find a better country to have opportunity in it. And I've traveled all over the world in the past five years and have seen everything, and this is the, it's the problems we have, whatever they are, this is the best place to be. Yeah, I definitely agree. And the last thing I want to talk to you, which also has to do with your books, is how important is it to network? As I know you personally and how many hedge fund managers that you know and how many people you know. I mean, you probably go into restaurants and get stopped now. But even in the business community, it seems like – you know, you've built up a, a contact list of who's who, and you need to do. You have to have a special personality to do that. You need to do that. Talk a little bit of how important that is, even for writing books and even being in the market and, and life in general. Networking is incredibly value, valuable, and it compounds uh, in value. So, but it doesn't mean going to networking events and handing out your business card. It doesn't mean go, going on LinkedIn and linking in with a lot of people. It means find two people that you know and introduce them to each other. If I think, oh, it would be great to introduce Frank to Steve because I think they can really help each other out, uh, then I make that introduction. Let's say they create value for each other. Then in a small, indirect way, value is created for me because years down the road, Frank and Steve will both remember who created that value for them, which was James Altucher. And you do that every day. Every day I try to think of six people I can introduce to each other, you know, two, three pairs of two people. And as long as I call it permission networking, I get permission first on either side. Hey, uh, Frank, do you want to meet Steve? Steve, do you want to meet Frank? Here's what I think you can do for each other. Then I make the introduction. Then I don't have to do anything else, but I've just created value for me. I've just planted seeds that might not bloom for 10 years, but they will bloom eventually. And that compounds across time, across not just days and weeks, but, but years and potentially decades. You know, when I launched this book, I took, you know, I have a network go going back 20 years. People helped me from all across that network in terms of getting the word out about this book. And it's been really amazing. Yeah, that is fantastic advice, uh, introducing people. And, and even with this podcast, where I'm fortunate to, to, to interview so many different people and build a networking list. That's really fantastic advice. Just It's almost like taking a step back and introducing people. And again, it has benefits long term. I love that. Uh, and you know, some people ask, what if you only know one person and you can't introduce two people? Then what I do is I come up with ideas that can help a person in their business. So this is the idea machine part. So if you if you know you're coming up with good ideas and you've exercised your idea muscle well enough, you can start generating ideas for people. So then I will introduce ideas to a person. So I might say, Frank, here's 10 ideas you can use for your next radio show. And if you want, I'll help you find the guests. And you'll look at them and say, hey, three of these 10 ideas might be good ideas. Value has been created. You know, that's indirectly how I met you, Frank, because in 2002, when I was totally dead broke and about to go bankrupt and losing my house, I sent Jim Cramer 10 ideas for articles he should write. I didn't want any credit. I just wanted him to write the articles. And so he wrote back and said to me, hey, these ideas are great. Why don't you write them? And that's when I started writing for Street.com, which indirectly is how I met you. That's how the network compounds. Yeah, it's just amazing. Well, we're talking to James Altucher, entrepreneur, author, and also great stock analyst, which we're going to get to right now. Uh, talk about some of the well, – you know what? Let's get to the mark conditions first. You're always an optimist. Uh, you, every, even, even when I see on CNBC, when people say, well, you know, these are the risks, you always seem to, to be optimistic on the economy. How do you feel right now with the stock market up so much? Uh, are you just more of a bottoms-up guy where you're picking certain, sec certain uh, stocks, individual stocks? Or are you looking at the economy as a whole and saying, hey, we're pretty good. There's a lot of opportunity here to make money in stocks. Well, you know, corporations, at uh, corporations, profits are at an all-time high, but that's because they're able to fire everybody. So everybody's kind of outsourcing overseas, or they're using technology, or they're using temp staffing companies, which is why I've been bullish in the temp staffing industry. But for the economy as a whole, I think well, we have a lot of problems because of government and because of Federal Reserve intervention that makes me unhappy. But the flip side of the economy is that you have – 
you know, Google creating cars that drive themselves. You have companies that are, you know, doing amazing strides in diagnosing cancer and other diseases. You have, uh, you know, companies that are, are biogenetically growing algae to create biofuels. Like, there's so much technological innovation that we can only grow from here. But there's hurdles along the way that make me nervous which is why I don't like necessarily investing in the broader stock market, although I think overall it'll grow over time. I like to kind of pick my spots and get behind, you know, huge demographic trends. You know, that's why I wrote this report for you guys recently, you know, what five stocks I think can go up a thousand percent. I think you're packaging that with uh, uh, selling my book, uh, Choose Yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And and one thing I'm going to say, take this as a compliment, is I consider you more like a tech geek in terms of, you're always ahead of the trends when it comes to technology. Even when it was Facebook, when it was Twitter, when it was YouTube, uh, you're always well ahead of these trends. I don't know if that has to do with, with, with your networking, but I wanted to talk to you about one stock in particular. It's called Ringo. Uh, and when I was on, when I actually hosted Porter's podcast that day, this was a stock that you talked about. And a technology company has a lot of patents in which Google, Microsoft, Yahoo have infringed on. And after you recommended it, the stock jumped. Literally, they came out with a decision on one of the patents or Google or something, and it jumped like 20 25%. And people were like, Frank, I can't believe it. That stock's great. And now since then, of course, the news is out. The stock has come down. Are you still following this this name, which it seems like a very, very interesting name in the tech space? Yeah, so, so Ringo's a very long-term hold for me. Uh, and you know the reason this is, again, part of the networking – so the reason I follow this stock is that in 1990, I used to, uh, I put guy together and he was working on software that helps you essentially, uh, you know, and this is even pre search engines. He was working on software that helped, uh, you figure out what a piece of text was about. If you looked at, if a computer looked, at an article, what would this article be about? So he started making more software around this and filing patents, and these are patents that ultimately Google, Microsoft, AOL, all these big companies started literally, let's be nice, they started borrowing from his patents. His company was eventually bought by Lycos. Lycos, the search engine, used this technology. Uh, and look, Google now has lost the court case. You know, very, so, so Ken Lang, to make a long story short, Ken Lang joined Ringo. They bought the patents from Lycos, which is basically dying somewhere in India. And Ringo sued Google, Microsoft, and AOL. Well, AOL settled. Microsoft is in settlement talks. Google lost the court case, but they're trying to fight it. And meanwhile, Ringo has raised, I don't know, like $60 million or so, and they're buying more patents. They then bought all these great patents from Nokia. Their top attorney in-house was Nokia's top attorney who sued Apple successfully for a billion. So in general, this company's got a long and profitable future in front of it. They've been very smart about how they're spending money buying patents. I mean, these Google patents, they bought for just $3 million from Lycos, and they're already, you know, potentially winning up to $600 million from them. So every dollar they raise is going to be used to, to buy patents in a very intelligent manner. So, again, that was, though, networking. A, a hedge fund manager I knew called me up and said, hey, I, I want to show you this stock, Ringo, and it's got this guy who used to be at Lycos. And I'm, I'm like, wait a second, who's the guy at Lycos? And he said, Ken Lang. And so I called Ken. I'm like, Ken, you know, what's going on? We haven't spoken in 10 years, but, you know, what's the story? So it was, it was a good way of uh, reconnecting on my network from, from three different angles. Yeah, that is pretty cool. Now, now again, someone who talks to hedge fund managers and knows the latest trends, what are you looking at now in terms of technology? I mean, the cloud we hear about all the time. Big data is something that I've written about a ton. I think is enormous. I mean, even more, more advances to, to social networking, 3D printing. I mean, what are you seeing right now that catches your attention that you're like, wow, I have to either invest in this business or maybe buy stocks around it? Well, I am invested in a lot of private companies that are involved with like the cloud and big data. But in terms of the public company space, you know, Right now, the U.S. is going through this enormous energy boom that most people don't realize. The fastest growing city in the country is Williston, North Dakota, because of oil drilling. And and why is that happening? Because technology in fracking has improved so fast that you can now drill for hard-to-find oil in environmentally clean ways. So I'm invested in um, a company called Petro River, PTRC, that uh, is 
you know, drilling for oil along the Mississippi line. I'm also a big believer in cancer diagnostics. I think the technology has improved by leaps and bounds, and that because of 70 million baby boomers retiring, this is a trend that is never going away. Like, everyone's going to get cancer, and every, and prevention is the cure, so diagnostics is the direction to go. It's just an odd, it's like, it's like Warren Buffett in 1980 buying Coca-Cola. It's now, it's about diagnosing cancer. So, and maybe they're even a direct outcome of each other. So, you know, another big demographic trend is temp staffing. Uh, you know, the fact that the Fortune 500 is firing all their full-time employees because they can't handle regulations and all the other issues of, of you know, per- PERMA employees. So they're hiring temp employees. The temp industry is up something like 50% year over year where the economy is basically flat. So these are some of the trends I look at. Again, I actually drill down and, and uh, uh, give some specific stock picks in, in the report that you guys are packaging with, with my book. Outside of the report, I'm not going to let you go without giving us maybe one or two stock picks because I know you're an idea guy and you always have stock picks every single week. If you have them, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Do you have yeah. anything that, that specific, even if it's a large cap company, they're like, wow, you know what, guys, you, you should really own this. This seems like it's a, it's a really good play. All right. And I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you one straight from the heart that this one is gonna be incredible over the next ten years. And and it's a large cap stock. It's hard for a large cap stock to go up more than a hundred percent because that's a huge move. But Disney has everything going for it. And I'm not talking about the parks. I'm not talking about Mickey Mouse. I'm talking about Star Wars. So they bought Star Wars. They bought Lucasfilm for two billion dollars, and they're gonna make. They're not going to make three more movies. They're going to make 50 more movies over the, over the next 50 years. And each one of those movies is going to make for them two billion in profits. So they're going to make back the cost that they spent on Lucasfilm 50 times over. Meanwhile, the Avengers is a franchise. The X-Men are a franchise. Captain America is a franchise. Iron Man is a franchise. You know, they're making such smart acquisitions under Bob Iger. They've got a great relationship with all the technology companies. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're really got a good relationship with Apple, with Google, with Facebook. So I think Disney's one of the smartest companies out there uh, and led by one of the best CEOs on the planet. And people don't realize how huge those superhero characters, those movies, the, the merchandise, how big those brands are, right? Yeah. And it was just, it was really, I, I actually don't understand why Marvel sold to Disney and why Lucasfilm sold to Disney, other than the fact that maybe the guys who were running the companies just got tired and said, okay, we let Disney take over, because they sold for dirt cheap prices, and Disney is going to milk them, like movies, toys, comic books, books, clothes, everything, uh, you know, new rides, new parks. This is just this a nonstop money machine. And one thing Americans like, and one thing the world likes, is we want good, cheap, fun entertainment. Going to a movie, having popcorn, going on a ride, reading a comic book, this is never going to go away, it, no, no matter what the economy does. Yeah, that's a great point. Well, James, uh, we'll leave it there. I, I want to thank you for joining the podcast. I want to congratulate you on the success of, of your new book. And, and, of course, if you know you need anything, give me a shout. You said one of your d- ideas that you like is, is the shell regions. I'm actually we're trying to do a 60-minute style documentary. I just visited the Klein Shell, the Eagleford. We're going to Marcellus. We're going to North Dakota in a couple of weeks. So if you have any, any information. Wow, oh, good for you. That's going to be great. Yeah, I did definitely give me a shout. And, uh, again, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to, to be in the podcast, man. I miss you, bud. Check out the McDonald's when you go to Williston, North Dakota. It's it's one of the it's the fastest growing McDonald's in the country. Eighteen million in revenues, which is like three times higher than the average McDonald's. It's amazing what's happening there. I definitely will, definitely will, man. <laughs> All right, well, thanks a lot, Frank. Thanks for having me on the show. Stansberry Radio is a purely public broadcast and is not intended to be personalized financial advice for any individual specific situation. Each individual's financial situation is unique and Stansberry Radio should not be relied upon and or considered as personalized advice. Stansberry Radio is not licensed to render personalized advice and should be considered simply the public opinions of Stansberry Radio and its guests. Recommendations on specific financial securities are not intended to address any listener's particular financial situation. 
Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform is making it easier than ever to support Black-owned brands. When you go to walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited, you'll not only get to shop products from Black-owned brands, but also learn about founders like Janelle Stevens of Camille Rose, which specializes in products for naturally curly hair. Or the Allison Devon, founder of Teespressa. And there are many more awesome products that you have yet to discover. It's all easy to find with Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform. Join in on celebrating Black brands today and every day at Walmart. We are Black and Unlimited. Visit walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited to discover more. That's walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited.